Greetings, everyone. I'm a new member of a sermon writers group at Edgewood United Church of Christ. These are folks who gather together to share their ideas and sharpen their thoughts from sentences into sermons as lay people, supporting the notion that hardworking pastors deserve a break. In her sermon series, Unraveled, Finding God, When Our Plans Fall Apart, Pastor Liz Miller is exploring the disruptions of 2020. Today, I chose to tackle her theme with a talk on Unraveled When Plans for Our Children Fall Apart. First, let's start with the Exodus story you heard in our scripture reading. And I ask you to grant me a writer's license to retell the Bible passages from the mother's point of view. The story goes, Jochebed was an Israelite woman who gave birth to a beautiful son. She loved him and nursed him in secret for three months, while great terror was gripping her. She birthed her baby in a time of great tumult for Hebrew mothers. You see, a new pharaoh had risen to power after Jacob saved Egypt from a great drought and brought many of his kin to the land of Egypt, where they became enslaved. enslaved. The new pharaoh was nervous because the Hebrew population kept growing, and he greatly feared they would gain too much power. His edict was fearful. Take all of the Hebrew male babies and throw them in the Nile River to drown. Jochebed's situation was dire. She loved her baby. She and her husband Amram had a firstborn daughter, Miriam. What would I do without my daughter, Miriam, she thought. And why, just why, should any of us sacrifice our sons? make them food for the crocodiles in the river. But it was getting harder to hide him. His cries grew louder. She lived in daily torment. She knew she had to act. With bulrushes from the river, she wove a small box-like basket. The Hebrew word for this is teba. She coated the little carrier with tar and pitch from the tribe's supply. If I place the basket in the thick reeds, he will be in the Nile, she rationalized. Her mind darted to all of the horrible possibilities. Surely Jehovah will save him somehow. I must be quick and discreet. Miriam watched everything from a distance that day when Jochebed put the teba holding her son in the thicket of reeds in the Nile River. Soon after, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the Nile. Her guards stood high above on the river bank. She saw the teba among the reeds. She sent a female servant to retrieve it. She heard muffled cries as she opened it. Right away, she saw it held a Hebrew baby boy. He was certainly beautiful. She decided she would keep him, care for him, as her own son, she told her slaves the plan. Having watched carefully, Miriam approached and asked, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? When Pharaoh's daughter answered, Yes, Miriam ran to her mother, saying, Come with me, hurry, she's waiting. When Jochebed hurried to the Nile, Pharaoh's daughter told her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So Jochebed joyfully took her baby home, and he grew under her careful teaching. Then Jochebed brought him to the palace and gave him to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. The ruler's daughter named the baby Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now, in the slave Jacobod's actions, we see desperation, quick thinking, resourcefulness, and faith. We also see great dis civil disobedience. The building of the little Teba certainly spared Moses, but it defied Pharaoh's edict. 
in Pharaoh's daughter, we see privilege at work. Still, many questions remain about her character and motivation for taking the baby in. Even though she opened a space in the Pharaoh's world for a slave child, Scripture later, later tells us that Moses renounced his Egyptian mother and privileged life to confront Pharaoh and deliver the Israelites from bondage. This Hebrew word, tibah, is only mentioned one other time in the Bible, when Noah built his box-like boat and ark to save the inhabitants of the earth from a prophesied flood. Both times Atiba was built, the vessels were used for salvation, for deliverance from oppression and corruption, for a journey from chaos to peace. The builders had faith that God would somehow act to save and restore the world to justice. Here at Edgewood United, we believe our church has a mission of social justice, that we are called to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with God, as Micah states. Now, let's turn our attention to another unfolding story, which shares some similarities and some differences from the Exodus story. In the middle of spring 2020, our world was disrupted. No one escaped. Life as we had lived it changed in a day span. We sequestered ourselves to flatten the curve of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Those whose salaries allowed them to stay home stayed safer, but with a reliance on essential workers, such as healthcare providers, grocery workers, delivery people, and postal carriers. Those who had to work outside of the home did so at greater risk to, of exposure to the killer virus. On May 25th, after weeks of daily updates on the viral spread and 100,000 dead in America, the country woke to an early May Memorial Day. A homebound nation with fewer distractions turned into the news of an horrific tragedy. A video aired of a brutal killing, this time by a white policeman's knee dug deep and too long into the neck of yet another subdued black man. Like Mount St. Helens erupting, the collected tortured cries of African Americans, indeed most Americans, exploded. Their accumulated responses to slavery and racism were unleashed after seeing George Floyd die with the last words, I can't breathe, and in his futile turn for help to his deceased, Mama. Black Lives Matter. That dark day, the national focus pivoted from viruses to racism. People donned masks and took to the streets. Early crowds became throngs. International protesters joined their voices. Martin Luther King Jr. said, A riot is the voice of the unheard. To consider both of these stories, we are left to think about a desperate mother. What a desperate mother might do to save her children from a senseless death. What wouldn't any African-American mother do to save a beloved child from being murdered? And then we must grasp, grapple with a personal response to the question, how do I, in a time of global panic, focus my efforts to end entrenched racism? Watching, which, watching with great sadness, the horse-drawn hearse that carried Floyd's body to his burial led to this reflection. We need to see the world through our black brothers' and sisters' eyes, through the eyes of sustained losses. The work of justice and reconciliation is upon all Americans now, and it won't be easy. If a riot is the voice of the unheard, then empathetic listening is the great remedy for all the brokenhearted. Find someone unlike you from a different walk of life. 
listen to their story and begin to understand their world, you already understand yours. When you hear a baby cry or a grown man call for his mama, it's your time to act. Use whatever resources you have and act on faith. Build a tiba. It's your time to act. Use whatever resources you have and act on faith. Build that tiba, a space where your sacred imagination can bring deliverance for someone. This is how our nation's justice will be put right. Black lives matter. Amen.